Formula One in the 2000s was full of controversy. You had things like Renault's mass dampers, which got banned because the FIA believed that they constituted a movable aerodynamic device. You also had things like the Michelin tyre scandal of 2003, another Michelin tyre scandal in 2005 at Indianapolis, and things like Crashgate and Spygate. There's others as well, but if I stopped to name them, we'd be here all day. And every single one of those controversies kicked up a massive storm in the Formula 1 media, the wider motorsport media, and also on the message boards, which is how we communicated pre-social media. But one thing that passed everybody by at the time, and is still not really talked about today, is something that one engine manufacturer in Formula 1 tried to do at around the turn of the century. And just like many of the controversial happenings of the 2000s, the two teams involved were Ferrari and their arch rivals at the time, McLaren. Ferrari had got a McLaren innovation banned already in 1998, and that was the magic brake pedal. What happened here is McLaren had fitted a second brake pedal to the MP412, sort of mid-season 1997, and this allowed Coulthard and Hakkinen to add some extra braking to one of the rear wheels to improve corner exit performance and get more rotation. I guess in a similar manner to how a tank will stop one of its tracks to be able to turn on a sixpence. It was discovered when the motorsport media realised that the brakes on the McLaren at that time were glowing on corner exit, instead of glowing on corner entry. Well, they were still glowing on corner entry, but they were still glowing again on corner exit, and they were wondering how the hell this was actually happening. Then following the Austrian Grand Prix, it was around that time, one of the photographers in the paddock stuck his camera into Hakkinen's McLaren and took a snap. That picture then made the front page of every motorsport magazine and publication everywhere. Then in 1998, McLaren had made improvements to the system, and that is why at the start of the season, Hakkinen and Coulthard had more than a second over the cars behind. But Ferrari had taken exception to this brake system, protested it, and then got it banned. And this, on top of Goodyear bringing improved tyres to Argentina, it meant that McLaren's advantage evaporated. So between sort of 1998 and 2001, Ross Braun and Ron Dennis would be at each other's throats, ready to get anything banned that constituted a unfair advantage, or just dared to exploit anything in the rulebook. You know, a bit of tit for tat as it were. But then in sort of 1999, the protests started regarding something that Mercedes was doing to the engines. Something that is actually probably more genius than that second brake pedal, which I'm told is in Automobilista 2, and I should probably give that a try at some point. At some point in the 1999 season, Ross Braun had figured out that something was off with the Mercedes engine in the middle of the McLarens. The engine was revving to around the same amount as the Ferrari engine, which was around sort of 17, 17 and a half thousand RPM in those days, but even though it was revving to the same amount, it was generating way more power. And the reason for this is because Mercedes was using the latest wonder material in terms of engine construction, beryllium. Mercedes and Ilmore had worked out how to fashion this stuff into pistons for the F0110H V10 engine powering the two MP414s of Hakkinen and Coulthard. The piston stroke was longer than that of the Ferrari, but this longer stroke resulted in more power, despite running at the same sort of 17 to 17.500 rev range that the Ferrari had. Beryllium is also light, strong, and very stable at high temperatures, so it sounds perfect for use in Formula 1 engine construction. Now, this stuff is also used in a lot of precision instruments. It's used for things like X-ray machines, and it's also used in the aerospace, weapons, and space exploration industries. The new James Webb telescope has parts made of beryllium, and there have been rocket nozzles on space shuttles, space rockets, and cruise missiles made out of pure Beryllium. So using this wonder material, Mercedes had created a beryllium alloy piston for the V10 engine that was in the McLarens. What they did was they fused beryllium with aluminium. Now the thing is with beryllium, it's quite elastic, so they were probably stretching it to what they needed it to be, and then fusing it with aluminium so that once it heated up and cooled down and heated up and cooled down, it was less brittle, because that happens to beryllium when it's cooled down after being heated up. So they needed it to be strong and light and aluminium, beryllium, two lightweight metals, brilliant. So what's the catch then? Well, number one, it's the price. In 2020, one kilogram of beryllium will set you back approximately 640 pounds, which is equivalent to around 850 US dollars. I can't find the actual price of it in 1999, but from looking around, it appears that the price of beryllium was actually dropping or was about to drop around that time. 
Number two, and this is probably the whole TLDR of why it was banned, is that beryllium isn't particularly pretty to work with. It's actually listed on the International Agency for Research on Cancer as a grade one carcinogenic, which puts it in the same category as things like asbestos, benzene, and plutonium. There are certain precautions that have to be followed when working with the stuff, as a condition called chronic beryllium disease can be triggered in about 2-5% to of the people who are unfortunate enough to breathe in beryllium dust. It basically permanently scars the lungs. It's estimated that over 100 employees at the US Department of Energy have had this condition. Now imagine what the original variant of COVID would do to your lungs if you got it pretty severely, only about, what, 100 times worse. I mean, I still haven't got my lung capacity after having it last year, and it's been, what, nine months or so now? Now, Ron Dennis was certain that once this alloy was created, those risks went away, and the engines posed no danger to anybody, even as the pistons got worn through normal use on the track. Any dust that made its way into the exhaust and out into the air would not do anybody any damage, and the only risks to health were during the manufacture of these pistons. It's estimated that beryllium made up about 30% of these pistons, the remaining 70% being aluminium. And since we'll never know the true motives behind getting this stuff banned, we do have at least three reasons why Ferrari might have protested. Number one, genuine concern for the health of the engineers, mechanics and fans if any of this beryllium oxide got out into the air at a race, or especially in a garage. Number two, while the danger to human and animal health was non-existent, Ferrari could argue the case anyway, knowing that getting something banned on safety grounds was much easier to do when it came to something that exploited a massive grey area in the rulebook, especially with Mosley's hard-on for safety in the sport since we're only four years post-Ratzenberger in 1999. And then there's number three, we didn't think of that, and for us to make our own version to catch up will be too effing expensive. Please ban. And costs were listed as the main reason that this was all banned when the FIA finally did ban it in around 2001. Now Mercedes and Peugeot were the only two engine manufacturers to actually get a beryllium aluminium alloy engine into service and Arrows said that they too would have built one if they could have afforded it. But the problem is if all the engine manufacturers then start building these engines they have to put more money in to build them and then inevitably the costs at which they sell them will also go up. So what then happens is the likes of Minardi and teams like that would have to have either bought underpowered non-BEAL engines or spent money they didn't have just to keep up. But weirdly, beryllium is more abundant on planet Earth than silver despite costing about $300 more. In a mad way, the FIA banned beryllium engines because of costs and also the risks to public health. But the prices of engines skyrocketed even with the ban, because all the engine manufacturers started looking for the next new wonder material with which to build super powerful engines that were also lightweight. And since they couldn't use beryllium anymore, they started buying anything that had similar properties, and they finally settled on boron carbide. Now, boron costs about $3.50 a kilo, so it's as cheap as chips. Well, two large bags of chips from the local chip shop, and it's used in health supplements for period pain and stuff like that. But the problem is, boron carbide takes a lot of time and energy to manufacture, so all added up, it costs about 10 times more than any other ceramic on the market, to the tune of about $2,000 per kilo. And Ferrari got the best deal out of it because of their partnership with Shell. Now, Shell has a history of being good with ceramics, and they managed to crack this whole boron carbide alloy thing to get a powerful engine, which does make sense given that there was a forum post from 2001 that says that there were rumours in the F1 paddock that Ferrari had got ceramics in their 2001 engine, despite the rulebook at the time saying otherwise. But again, grey areas, this time without the cancer-causing agents. So Ferrari went on to win the double from 2000 to 2004, while McLaren started sliding backwards as Nui tried to repackage the car and come up with new pieces of aero wizardry to offset the losses. Nui would develop cars that had weird aero quirks and were super lightweight to try and offset the lack of engine power, culminating with the catastrophe that was the MP418, while Mercedes tried everything they could to come up with a more powerful engine that was, more often than not, unreliable. Meanwhile, off Ferrari went. Now, I'm not saying that the banning of beryllium aluminium alloy engines was the actual reason that Ferrari went on their domination run, but 
it's a contributing factor. How much of a contributing factor? Well, that much remains to be seen. And as a bonus, apparently Mauro Foglieri was messing about with beryllium brake ducts back in the 1970s, but no proof as far as I can see. Now these days, beryllium is allowed, but only in tiny quantities. Copper-based alloys can only contain 2.75% beryllium, and other alloys can only contain 0.25% beryllium, listed under Article 5 of the Technical Regulations for 2021. It is an interesting story though, and one that I've never really put the time into research, even though I've heard quite a bit about it. And because those old forum posts are still online from sort of 2001 or so, you can actually see what people were saying at the time, as opposed to relying on people's warped memories or rose tinted goggles of the, the whole thing. There is still no proof to suggest that these pistons would have posed a threat to public or animal health you know, after the manufacturing process was completed, but you would think that the actual ban was put in to protect the people at the engine plants who are making these pistons because, you know, they're not necessarily qualified in the grand scheme of things to work with this stuff safely because they're used to working with other metals and the different manufacturing processes that come with them. So it was probably for the best, you know, just a precautionary ban, that kind of thing. I mean, as one person had written as I was putting this together, imagine having somebody throw an apple and a hammer at you. You know, both of them are not particularly safe, but one is going to hurt a lot more than the other. So then a look at the potentially dangerous beryllium aluminium alloy engines that McLaren was playing with, well, Mercedes was playing with in the late 90s and into the early 2000s. If you've learned something here today, then be sure to give the video a like. And if you want more stuff like this from the history books of motorsport and things like that, then be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and get the bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon who continue to support the channel. And if you want to help cover the costs of image licensing and stuff like that, you can support by following the link in the description, as well as finding links down there to my Discord and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. And now I'm off to do some practice for Sunday night because it's the Hungara Ring in ACC, the Sunday League thing that I do with the Lawrence de Soswas community. It's always a great bit of banter with the Discord chatter in the background and stuff like that. It's just a bit of a fun, chilled Sunday night stream. So I'll try and get everything set up for that and I'll put the, the live thing up so you can you know, like it and get reminded of when it's going up and, and all that stuff. And I hope to see you on Sunday night for that. But if you don't particularly want to watch me drive in circles whilst shouting swear words at the fact that I can't go very quick, I'll see you all on Monday for another video. So on Sunday or Monday, I'll see you whenever. Goodbye.